It's almost 1 p.m. in Sydney and 11 a.m. in Hong Kong. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Paul Allen. Here are the top stories. Asian stocks pairing session losses as Japanese indexes turn positive. Volatility still gripping markets with investors evaluating policy, geopolitical and recession risks. Traders on guard for potential pivot signals out of the RBI when it makes its policy call next hour. And we'll hear why Bloomberg Economics expects a rate cut. Plus, exclusive insight on the Adani Group's infrastructure ambitions. We're going to ask one of its next generation leaders about the impact of the Hindenburg short seller allegations. I think it was a, definitely, a, personally speaking, a very stressful and tough time. Um, you know, emotions were high. All right, let's check in on how markets are faring. Avril Hong is in Singapore, and Avril uh, stocks in Japan are back in the green. Yeah, somehow we're seeing that bounce after it started the day on the back foot. Declines of about 2.5% on the Nikkei. And those declines were coming against the backdrop of what we saw on Wall Street after a weak Treasury auction. Given how low yields were, there was very little appetite for Treasuries. And that is really what sapped sentiment in these U.S. stocks. We saw the major indices closing lower. U.S. futures are picking up slightly. But we're also keeping a close watch on what we're seeing on the yen as we see it erasing some of the gains from earlier on in the session. Relatively weak still. The offshore yuan is also one to watch as we got it at 7.08 not so long ago. The PBOC and the Fed are both expected to ease, but it's interesting how the Fed could ease more aggressively. And today, we actually got the PBOC coming through with a fix that was above 7.14 for the first time since November last year. So this signals to us that maybe the PBOC doesn't want the Chinese currency strong just yet. Let's flip the board and take a look at what we're seeing on the yen. Yesterday, the weakness was triggered by the BOJ Deputy Governor Uchida's comments and we are actually seeing some expectations previously that the BOJ summary of opinions for the July meeting were coming a bit hawkish, reinforced what Governor Ueda said last week. Uh, it's seen as not hawkish enough, although we did get one BOJ member saying that he sees the neutral rate or she sees the neutral rate at roughly 1%. This is really far from where we are now at 0.25%. So I think this is all being digested by the markets and we're seeing relative weakness still in the Japanese currency. Paul. All right. Thanks very much, Avril. Uh, joining us now for more, Bloomberg M Live strategist Mark Cranfield and our guest, Chetan Ayer, Chief Asia Economist at Morgan Stanley. And uh, Mark, I just want to start with you to take a look at that rally that we're seeing in uh, Japanese equities at the moment. I mean, you know, what's going on? Is the carry fully unwound, a function of the weak yen, volatility, dip buying? Uh, pick your theory. Yeah, all of the above. Uh, it's a, a dysfunctional market you're seeing in, in Japan, and that's not too surprising when you consider the extreme volatility you've seen in the past week. You've, it, it's really a, a market currently of headless chickens. People are just chasing everything, every headline, every nuance in the market, and it's very difficult for anybody to take a clear direction from anything that they're seeing, especially today of all days. So in the past 24 hours, we seem to have had conflicting messages from the Bank of Japan. We've had Uchida saying one thing that sounded dovish, then we've had the minutes which sound hawkish. Uchida even walked back some of his comments yesterday as well. It's no wonder that equity traders and yen traders really don't know which direction to go at the moment. Once things settle down, what they will be looking at is the fact that there are still four more Bank of Japan meetings to come this year. Plenty of time for the Bank of Japan to raise interest rates if market conditions allow them. And then you've got a whole bunch of Federal Reserve meetings as well. So in terms of expecting volatility to die down, unlikely. We're going to have plenty of it. And we've got US elections coming as well. People are just going to get used to it. What's happening in Japan is probably going to stay for some time yet. All right. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Chetan Iyer, our Chief Asia Economist at Morgan Stanley. And uh, Chetan, Mark pointing out that, that there are another four Bank of Japan meetings this year, four opportunities to cut, but also four opportunities for more chaos. So, I mean, what's your opinion of some of the communications we have heard from the BOJ in the past week or so? And uh, do they need to maybe change the tack a little bit? 
Yeah, um, uh, good morning. Um, so I think essentially, I think the, the key challenge that uh, BOJ has is that the communication from the governor was a bit more hawkish than what was, I think, required. Um, and then we have seen that the deputy governor has come and clarified. I think the most important point, which was there in the policy statement, uh, but then also clarified yesterday in the deputy governor's comment, is that there is endogeneity in financial markets conditions and the economy. And the most important comment that was laid in the monetary policy meeting was that the fact that uh, there has been rise in imported, price, uh, imported prices, and that's putting upward pressure on Japan's inflation. Um, so I think that was the first time BOJ was so explicit. In the past, um, we had seen that the BOJ speakers were talking about the fact that currency is depreciating, but its path through to underlying inflation is not that much. But in the previous meeting, they really tried to do that. Um, so I thought that, you know, markets should have appreciated that as if the currency appreciates as it did, then obviously the BOJ will not be able to hike uh, as much as uh, they would have wanted. And that uh, endogeneity point, I thought, was very important, clarified by the deputy governor. So it should be now, I think, uh, a bit more stable, the markets, because um, this, mm -hmm. this volatility has effectively been now checked by that communication. Well, we also see the yen uh, softening a little, as you mentioned there. It's depreciated a bit. We're back at 146.47 uh, right now. But uh, this is obviously not sustainable as the Fed continues to ease. The, the BOJ remains on a tightening path. Uh, where do you see the cross rate at the end of the year? So you're right. Uh, this is not just uh, what happens in. Uh, this is not just all about what happens in Japan, but it's also what happens in the U.S. and the U.S. data points. Um, so considering our uh, U.S. Uh, Fed policy rate path, which is that we're expecting three more rate cuts through to the end of the year, uh, and by uh, middle of next year we expect policy rates in the U.S. to come down to 3.5 to 3.75 band. Uh, and with that assumption, uh, marrying with our Japan policy forecast, which is that we're expecting BOJ to hike once more in January 2025, uh, we uh, never did build an additional rate hike after the policy meeting, which some of the consensus um, uh, economists uh, or the sell-side economists did. We always had a risk built in for the back half of this year for a 25 bips rate hike. Uh, but our base case is that BOJ takes policy rates up to just 0 0.5. And with those two policy rate forecasts for the Fed as well as for BOJ, uh, we think currency will be um, ending at uh, 146 by the year end. And uh, by middle of next year, it will be uh, up to uh, 140. Uh, Mark, just following on from uh, Chetan's point about uh, the Fed's likely pace of easing, uh, why do we have such an underwhelming U.S. Treasury sales? Uh, was that realistically priced, considering what we're expecting from the Fed in the next few months? Well, selling, trying to sell a 10-year Treasury below 4% was always going to be pretty challenging when it's more than 150 basis points below the Fed funds rate. Don't forget, the Fed hasn't even started to lower interest rates yet. And... When they do start, it's quite possible that they'll aim the neutral rate somewhere close to 4% anyway. So that makes a 10-year Treasury with a 3% handle pretty tough for people to digest, unless the Fed sees something much worse. If they see a hard landing coming, if they start talking about a recession themselves, which they're not doing yet, of course, then a 3% Treasury makes more sense. At the moment, they're not. They're pushing back on people saying they don't even really want to do 50 basis points in September. They just like to go with a 25 if they can do that. And they've got so much uncertainty to come. The U.S. economy is still doing pretty well, and they've got a U.S. presidential election to get round as well. So they certainly don't want the idea that people start pricing in a recession when it's not really there. So if you take all that into account, it's not too surprising. What probably happens now is that we've probably got some kind of a flaw under the long end of the Treasury yield curve. We may see lower rates in the, the short end, the one- to two-year sector. That may well happen if the Fed does go with a larger rate cut in September. But until then, pushing four-year yields much below four, or 10-year yields much below four, is going to be very difficult. Uh, Chetan, I want to get your view also on U.S. recession risk, if we can. Uh, of course, uh, Sam's rule was triggered, which suggests uh, we are in a recession. But then we heard from Claudia Sam herself, who came up with that rule, saying, well, look, we're not in a recession. 
Uh, do you feel like the Fed has uh, still got this path to a soft landing uh, firmly and realistically in its sights? That's right. So, look, our U.S. team, um, uh, led by our uh, chief economist, Seth Carpenter, had been basically out after this uh, employment data point that our base case still remains as a soft landing. Um, and when you look at number of data points, whether it was non-farm payroll print at 114K uh, or the fourth qu second quarter GDP data, or you look at the last month's retail sales, um, there is nothing in the data point that indicates that situation is so bad that the Fed needs to come out and do intermeeting or uh, even sort of guide to a 50 bips um, rate cut in September at this point of time. And the most important point that um, we are sort of focused on is that in this cycle, private sector balance sheets are very different in the U.S. Uh, the most, uh, if you look at the previous um, downturns, you would have been in this kind of a late cycle stage as far as the unemployment rate is concerned. And then Fed takes cost of capital to restrictive territory. But the private sector balance sheets would have levered up in the meantime, and then they go under to, through some kind of stress which causes defaults and brings us from a you know, slowdown into recession. But that link is missing in this cycle with both corporate as well as household debt to GDP has actually gone down below pre-COVID levels. And cumulatively, private sector debt to GDP has gone down by five percentage points versus pre-COVID levels. So we think that there is a slowdown coming, uh, but our base case is uh, still that uh, mm -hmm. it is going to be soft landing. All right, Mark Cranfield, Bloomberg M Life strategist, and Chetan Iyer, chief Asia economist at Morgan Stanley. Thanks so much for joining us. Still to come, Nobel winning economist Muhammad Yunus calling for calm in Bangladesh as he returns to head an interim government. We discuss the implications with a former Bangladeshi foreign secretary later this hour. First, though, we will speak with Gautam Adani's youngest son, Jeet, who oversees the family's airports and defence businesses. More in our exclusive series, taking you inside the Indian conglomerate up next. This is Bloomberg. More now in our exclusive series on the next generation of leaders being groomed to run India's $213 billion Adani group. Jeet Adani is the youngest son of the conglomerate's founder, Gautam Adani, and he heads their airports and defence businesses. The 26-year-old was a relative newcomer when short seller Hindenburg's allegations of fraud rocked the group last year. We asked him how that period impacted him and his family. Jeet Adani is the youngest son of Indian billionaire Gautam Adani. As part of the tycoon's succession plan, the 26-year-old engineer is overseeing the running of seven airports across the country, including the one in India's financial capital, Mumbai. The Adani Group is also building a brand new airport for the city at a cost of $2 billion. Along with airports, Jeet is responsible for the defense business while also looking after the group's digital initiatives. The youngest of the next generation of Adani leaders is being groomed to run big parts of an empire that's been rocked in recent years. In early 2023, just a few years after Jeet joined the family business, a report published by short seller Hindenburg Research accused the company of fraud and share price manipulation. It sparked a $150 billion meltdown in shares of group companies. The Adanis have denied the allegations, and their shares have recovered, but they're still dealing with the fallout. Bloomberg's Anto Antony spoke exclusively with Jeet Adani and asked him how the group's strategies have changed. You had just joined the business when the Hindenburg report came out. How did it affect you personally and what role did you play in that crisis situation? I think it was a, definitely, a, personally speaking, a very stressful and tough time. Um, you know, emotions were high. <laughs> but I think the most important thing that was on uh, my mind definitely was what can I do to support, obviously, the family? But more than that, how do I support the larger family, which is the employees? Because 
the biggest risk that you run in times like these is uh, demotivation. People, you know, sort of losing hope. And uh, to make sure that everyone is motivated, everyone knows that what we are doing is for a greater purpose. It's for, uh, we're making real impact. And we continue day on day on with the work because these things, they happen, they come, they go. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't want to lose motivation. Some of the investigations or props or allegations are still at an overhang on the group. How are you assuaging the investors' concerns in these times? So I think, you know, and this is based on some of the interactions that I've also had um, with investors over the past couple of months. I think there's a clear uh, understanding uh, with the investors that, you know, with the Hindenburg report, everything that was said and allegated uh, against us was sort of just rehashing old things again. And a lot of investors really appreciated the kind of communication that we've done over the last uh, 14, uh, 14, 18 months. At the end of the day, not a single investor's query will be left unanswered. We were proactively reaching out to investors after each and every report or article or anything that was coming out. Um, and with all the, uh, all the performance from the financial side also, um, they were very clear that, you know, look, this is a very good asset. All of the companies, they have strong infrastructure assets. And, they, you know, the leadership team has given us enough confidence by communicating with us enough. I think that's kind of helped actually uh, uh, investors to realize that, you know, to look beyond this and actually look at the asset, look at the leadership team, what kind of cash we're generating and, uh, and what, are, what kind of growth we're doing. You're overseeing construction of a $2.1 billion airport in the outskirts of Mumbai. Now, as I understand, the phase one construction is on time. However, my question is, is it too little too late? Because the way at which the expansion, the aviation market in India is expanding, would you have to like work on the remaining phases at a much faster pace than earlier envisaged? No, absolutely. I think you're right. Uh, you know, if you look uh, historically when um, the initial privatization of both Bombay and Delhi happened together in 2006, Bombay as an airport was actually larger than Delhi. And it was growing at the same pace as Delhi was growing, but it hit a roadblock because it has a capacity limitation being a single runway airport. And Delhi kept growing. It's now about 75, 80 million passengers per annum. The latent demand of Bombay as a city is not stopped growing. You know, people still want to fly. The ability to consume, ability to spend on travel is still very, very high and is still growing at the same rate. It's just that they don't have the, uh, the option or uh, they don't have the infrastructure to be able to take flights. So definitely, when it comes to your question on too little, too late, yes. Um, the good thing is we're getting there. You know, based on the initial conversations and uh, what our forecasts are for the first year itself, uh, once we start operations, we'll be pretty much exhausting 60-70% of the capacity of the new airport. And given that it takes anywhere from two and a half to three years from start of a new project to, uh, you know, commissioning, we will immediately need to start uh, phase two of another 30 million passengers uh, as soon as we finish phase one. You're all seeing the group's defense business. Now, India is a country with the world's second largest standing army. What scope are you seeing in the sector and how are you going about it? We primarily are focusing on areas where, um, you know, we think we can make a significant impact. That's why we're not chasing large capital projects like submarines or fighter aircraft, which we were in the past, but we've sort of redone our strategy now. Our strategy is focused on three things. The first thing is around unmanned systems. So unmanned aerial vehicles, ground vehicles, uh, water and submarine vehicles. Our first milestone we hit earlier this year when we delivered the first drone uh, to the armed forces. This was a male category drone. We have the capability to actually manufacture and design all the way from male category to micro rotocopters, which, you know, small copters, you can use it for the agricultural purposes as well. The second area around the, our defense uh, ecosystem is uh, on small arms. Small arms is very important because we see that based on the current equipment that the Indian armed forces have, you know, a lot of modernization needs to happen. And uh, we're very lucky that, uh, you know, we, we've been able to, um, uh, you know, win contracts to supply to them with an indigenization number of over 80%. And we, our target is by the end of the contract, we want to hit 200% levels uh, of indigenization. So the entire value capture will happen within India. And the third part of our portfolio around defense is on ammunition. We are the only private sector uh, ammunition manufacturer in India. Uh, um, you know, on the small caliber side, we manufacture and it's up and running already. We manufacture over a couple of hundred million rounds a year, which will be able to serve about half of the current yearly needs of the Indian Armed Forces. 
um, and uh, we're also expanding into medium and large caliber. So that sort of ties up the entire portfolio. Um, definitely when you look at scale, once all of this is run up and running at 100% capacity, this will be a very large scale business in itself. As we actually are building out this capacity, uh, we're also looking at new opportunities around defense where, you know, cyber security, looking at systems, uh, you know, mission systems, not just a manufacturing an, uh, as an OEM, one drone or one equipment, but actually tying the entire thing together into a battlefield mission system. That's sort of more future looking and then you have uh, or, what we're manufacturing today. So at this young age, you are running some of the big businesses in the region. At the same time, the chairman who is in his early 60s, an age at which many people contemplate retirement, he's putting in 18-hour workdays. Do you think he feels confident or you as G2 feel confident that if he decides to take a break, the G2 will be able to handle the businesses? Yeah, I think on a lighter side, I don't think he's going to be taking a break uh, anytime soon. For us, when we sit together as G2, the most important thing around this uh, is self-realization. I think we've we all realize, um, as a group of four of us, that you know, put together, our capabilities are not going to be able to match up to his because he's you know, is a once-in-a-generation kind of entrepreneur. But what we can do better is with the access and resources that we have, how do we train ourselves in aspects that we can control better? And we've identified on being successful, you need three things. You need the right people, you need to be able to handle the right people, and then you need uh, to manage risk. If you're able to do these three things as a family successfully, uh, definitely we'll be able to grow. I don't think all of us are there yet uh, in, the, uh, you know, in terms of capability on these three, but this is where we're working with the right mentors uh, to train us. That's Jeet Adani, the youngest son of Indian billionaire Gautam Adani. And our special coverage of the Adani Group continues tomorrow when we talk to Gautam Adani's nephew Pranav. He not only oversees most of the group's consumer businesses, but also runs one of their most complicated projects, redeveloping Asia's largest slum. And our coverage culminates with a special report on Friday at 11.30am Hong Kong time, with an encore presentation at 7pm, and that's 4.30 in Mumbai. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on how things are tracking in China right now. We uh, do have uh, equities in modestly positive territory. The CSI 300 better by uh, just under half of 1% there. Taking a look at the yuan as well. We uh, did have a fix above 7.14 today. First time since November, 7.146. Uh, suggest the PBOC is trying to avoid the risk of the dollar yuan uh, dipping below uh, that level that we saw earlier this month. We've also seen China's big state banks selling off seven-year government bonds in uh, sizable amounts on Thursday morning. Uh, this is according to traders. That's a sign authorities uh, ramping up their fight against that record debt rally that we've seen in China. Still to come, we're going to have the latest on the political upheaval in Bangladesh. Nobel winning economist Mohamed Yunus preparing to lead an interim government. Insight coming up with a former foreign secretary. This is Bloomberg. So Nikkei and S&P 500, uh, reasonable, notwithstanding the hedge funds and the volatility got what they wanted. Uh, and, it's, and, and, and by no means is it behind us, but the severity and the degree of it, we believe, is behind us. We're still in the soft landing camp. Our point is, look, uh, markets got spooked by the payroll last week. They got spooked by the ISM manufacturing data, uh, but the economy is not that bad. The market sentiment swinging to a recession with the SAM rule, etc., getting triggered. I'm still not in that camp because I think there are enough resilient factors in the U.S. economy. Even if we have a downturn, it's going to be a fairly shallow downturn. Uh, so it's sort of a mixed uh, bag because I think the policy reaction function does differ uh, across Asia and not everyone is uh, just following the Fed. All right, some of our guests there on the market impact of growing worries about a U.S. recession. Uh, with that in mind, let's check in on Japanese markets coming back from the lunch break. And uh, overall, things turning for the better in Japan. What's going on? 
Yeah, we saw Japanese equities erase those declines at the start of about 2.5%, managing to flip into the green. Now back from the lunch break and the Nikkei topics both extending gains from just before we went into lunch. And this is as some of these fears about Iran's retaliation on Israel ease. That is, of course, among the triggers that uh, led to the declines on Wall Street overnight. But, of course, the key sentiment driver, I think, was how we saw the U.S. Treasury auction. It came in with weak demand amid lower yields. That was something that really didn't spark appetite from investors. So we saw the major indices declining overnight. And today, it's not just the Japanese equities that are managing some gains. We're also seeing some of the other major Asia indices. Some of them are pairing the uh, declines. Others are clocking gains. Now, it's also uh, this U.S. Treasury auction, something we're watching because Japan has a 30-year auction of its own later today. We're going to find out in a couple of minutes the results of that, but the demand for that is also likely to be weak, so we could see the reaction in Japanese bonds as well. Dollar-yen hovering at 146. Of course, this is a bit of a climb from the weakness of the 147.7 a day ago, sparked by the BOJ Deputy Governor's comments. Let's flip the board. On a day like this, there are a number of names that are bucking the trend. Shiseido and SoftBank among them. And this is earnings related. Shiseido showed that demand from China was really anemic. It showed that first half loss. And amid all this, what we're seeing is the steepest decline in the stock since 1987. For SoftBank, we saw a loss and this was for the second quarter. Uh, it showed how despite the share buyback plan that really failed to lift the stock as we saw these losses coming through for its vision fund assets, Paul. Well, we've got a few other names, uh, big names set to report later as well. What are we expecting? Yeah, I think two clear themes are emerging from the number of names that are reporting later today out of the Asia-Pacific, and that is AI as well as weak Chinese demand. For the likes of Tokyo Electron, AI is likely to boost. We're going to probably see this operating profit at fastest pace of growth in two years. We could also be seeing guidance improve because it could benefit from these U.S. Uh, chip curbs to China. But can't say the same for the likes of SMIC. It is facing a lot of pricing competition, particularly in the low end of the market, and then weak demand for PC, for phone chips as well. So we could see a decline of 81% on its profits, and this would be the worst in years, even an operating loss. That is something uh, that the street might uh, is expecting, I should say. Chinese demand showing up in Guizhou Maotai earnings potentially and how it might be hitting these liquor sales. We could see the slowest earnings per share growth uh, in a long time and the stock is actually down about 25% in the past year but still we're seeing about 52 buy calls in terms of analyst recommendations. These are the earnings we're going to be keeping a real close watch on, Paul. All right, thanks, Averill. Let's get to the top geopolitical stories we're tracking now. Russia is declaring a state of emergency in its border Kursk region as it faces a Ukrainian assault. It's the largest such attack on Russian soil since President Vladimir Putin ordered the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. Moscow says as many as 1,000 Ukrainian troops have crossed the border and that Russia has deployed its military and airstrikes. Thailand faces fresh political turmoil after its top court ordered the largest opposition party to disband for violating election rules by promising to amend royal defamation laws. The court also banned the Move Forward Party's leaders from political activities for the next decade. The same court is set to rule next week on a petition to oust Prime Minister Shweta Tavison over an alleged ethical violation. The Bangladeshi army chief says an interim government will be sworn in on Tuesday following the ouster of former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Nobel economics laureate Mohamed Yunus is set to lead the administration and spoke with reporters in Paris on his way back to Bangladesh. Yes, I'm looking forward to going back home and uh, see what's happening there and how we can organize ourselves to get out of the trouble that we're in. Thank you very much. When will elections be held, do you know? Well, I'll go and talk to them. I'm just fresh in this whole area. Thank you.
more up for more. Let's bring in our news desk editor, Jill Desis. So, uh, Jill, what's the latest on this? Well, Paul, you just heard there from Mohammed Yunus. Uh, you know, he's urging for some calm in the wake of these violent protests as he heads back to Bangladesh to eventually, uh, we're expecting later this evening, be sworn in uh, as this interim prime minister. I mean, look, Mohammed Yunus, uh, he's got a lot of star power, um, not just within Bangladesh, as really being one of this nation's most famous faces, but also he's got a lot of clout with a lot of Western elites, also maybe at least, um, you know, somewhat uh, popular as, as an interim because he's not really associated with any political party and really has um, developed a, an incredibly prestigious reputation from, obviously, that Nobel Prize that he won, this idea that he pioneered, um, you know, a lot of major economic, uh, you know, advancements in, in microfinance and such. Uh, so he's at least expected to kind of lead this interim government in the short term. But long term, we still have a lot uh, less clarity on what exactly is going to be happening within Bangladesh. Um, we don't really have any clarity on who else might be a part of this interim cabinet, um, expecting at least a couple of months to, uh, you know, to actually sort of gear up for something of a more permanent transition. I think at this point, Yunus has in the past really never suggested that he wants to lead uh, you know, Bangladesh or anything like that on anything more than an interim basis here. So there's still just a lot that's going on in the air. He is expected to land um, later this afternoon in Dhaka. He's um, you know, on a plane from Dubai right now. Um, so we'll have to see what happens there. And then ultimately, like I said, kind of gearing up into this evening, um, you know, he's expected to kind of take charge there. And then, yes, still a lot uh, that's uncertain in this situation, Paul. Uh, we've also had an update on uh, the ex-Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina from her son. Uh, what did he have to say? Well, Paul, I think um, at this point uh, he's saying that she's not going to return to Bangladesh. I mean, this is a pretty dramatic ouster for Hasina. Um, obviously, her family, to a certain extent, has been in heavily involved um, with um, you know Bangladesh politics pretty much all throughout the modern era. She's the longest-serving um, PM. Um, you know, she's been elected consistently since uh, you know 2009 or so. Um, so, I mean, this is a really, really dramatic downfall for her. He was actually saying that she intended to really retire um, in a couple of years, but obviously, in the wake of you know a lot of these protests that really just seem to be untenable. A lot of her critics have also sort of accused her of kind of packing, um, you know, her cabinet with loyalists and, um, you know, sort of creating a lot of disconcert, discontent there. Um, for the family, um, he's saying that really none of them, um, you know, intend to return to Bangladesh. Where her ultimate uh, residence is is going to be up in the air. Um, we've heard from uh, Indian officials that she's staying at an undisclosed location somewhere in Delhi. Maybe she stays more permanently in India, but at this point um, there's just a lot, uh, you know, that's Again, still up in the air there, but um, she's not returning to Bangladesh. All right, News Desk Editor Jill Desis there. Well, joining us now from Dhaka is former Bangladeshi Foreign Secretary Shamsha Chowdhury. Uh, Shamsha, thanks so much for joining us today. We have heard from the incoming leader, Mohammed Yunus, he's calling for calm. Uh, are you confident that the worst is now over in Bangladesh? Well, uh, good morning from Bangladesh, Paul. Uh, uh, yes, it's a good news that someone of Yunus' uh, fame and name, uh, both at home and abroad, uh, is taking over on an interim arrangement. We still don't know how long the interim arrangement uh, government will be in place. It could be there for at least a uh, couple of years, although the BNP, a very large party, is calling for an immediate or early election. Now, what happens is uh, uh, the people are very excited. Uh, but Professor Yunus, uh, before he left Paris, was briefly talking to some reporters. He said the need for maintaining calm, otherwise we might lose what we have achieved so far. There has been incidents of violence and looting and vandalism, and some minority uh, uh, places of worship have been attacked and also vandalized. Although the, gov the government is uh, telling and uh, students are also protecting the minority places of worship and homes and businesses. Yes, it is a very dramatic uh, turn in history for Bangladesh. People are freeing, feeling being liberated uh, after uh, 15 years of very uh, suffocating rule by the Awamili government under Sheikh Hasina. And it started off as a student protest, but when police kept on shooting and killing uh, young students mm -hmm. uh, at point blank range, unarmed students at point blank range, it suddenly galvanized into a much bigger movement against the government. And in the end, mm -hmm. she was forced to leave on the 5th of August. Uh, your reporter very correctly says she's in India. Uh, I don't think she'll stay in India for long. She's looking to go somewhere else. 
there are legal complications of going to the United Kingdom, I understand, if she wants to seek political asylum. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and then her visa so, for the United States reportedly has been cancelled. So we don't know where she's going to go. Uh, she's looking for places in uh, in Europe. One rumor, and I'll insist in rumor, has mm -hmm. yet that she's trying to go to Belarus, uh, which is a, a you know, very uh, different kind of a uh, location one it would have thought to be, but you don't know. Yes, that, that would be an interesting would, choice, wouldn't know, it? Never know. Yes, it would yeah. be a strange choice. Um, so uh, there, there's going to be an interim government followed by elections. Uh, do you anticipate the Awami League is going to be part of any future government in Bangladesh? Well, the interim government, uh, one of the persons who are part of this, uh, one is social uh, civil society members, a uh, very, uh, very renowned uh, lawyer, um, Rizwana. She's uh, an environment lawyer, but very uh, publicly known uh, in the country. She has said that the interim government would need time to bring some fundamental changes in the government system. You know, uh, it's not like one group of bad apples being replaced by another group of bad apples. We've all seen the BNP and the Awami League in the past. Uh, but they are the two largest parties, so of course they will both take part in the election, and uh, it should be free, fair, and non-controversial election, uh, totally transparent election, and that the only way to ensure that is to have a non-party caretaker interim government conduct that election. Uh, we have seen what mm -hmm. happens when part when uh, elections are held under a particular political party, they end up being rigged and uh, totally unrepresentative. Uh, the last three elections are clear manifestations of that. That's why the people want to go back to an interim uh, election under an interim caretaker government, which will be for three months. But this one will be for a longer term because they want to bring this change into the constitution through the president and then have the election under that system. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that people are excited, but you also point out there that you know these sorts of reforms do take time. Uh, what's going to be the immediate area of focus for Muhammad Yunus? Well, first of all, I think he has to have a cabinet. Uh, we are told that it will be a cabinet of uh, non-party people for over uh, something like uh, 15 to 20 people, maybe more or less here and there. And then the immediate task would be restore calm and order in the country. There are still uh, scenes of uh, looting going on by miscreants, uh, maybe by people who want to destroy the image of the change that has happened. But it is important. And, you know, right now the police, uh, because the police, the people have turned against the police, uh, which is uh, the responsible for maintaining law and order, they are not there. So they have been called to report back to their places uh, by today, by the new Inspector General of Police, the head of police. We hope they will do. In the meantime, I think the military will play some role in maintaining law and order. But the military cannot do it over a long period of time. I mean, they cannot deploy themselves all over the country uh, maintaining law and order. They have a different job. And uh, the police force in Bangladesh was huge, more than 100,000 people. So they have to come back. They have to be allowed to come back to their places of duty and perform uh, their role mm -hmm. in preventing uh, and ensuring safety and security for the citizens, for everyone, for every single mm -hmm. citizen. And that is very important. Even the BNP has called for that. Professor Yunus has called for that. The leadership of the student movement have repeatedly called for that. So the first task will be to restore uh, order in the society and then prepare for an agenda of fundamental reforms in the governance system of Bangladesh. All right, uh, Shamsha Chowdhury, former Bangladeshi Foreign Secretary, thank you so much for joining us today uh, with your insights on the political situation there in Dhaka. just want to get you across some lines that we've been getting from the Reserve Bank of Australia Governor uh, Michelle Bullock. Uh, she's reiterating uh, what the RBA had to say earlier this week, uh, saying uh, we don't see interest rates in Australia coming down quickly. Uh, these were in remarks, uh, question and answer session uh, uh, at, to a speech at the Rotary Club of Armadale. This is in rural New South Wales. That's an annual event. Um, she was saying she uh, doesn't see interest rates coming down quickly uh, and had previously indicated that they would need to see a lot more evidence were they to change their mind. 
And earlier this week, uh, she was pointing out that inflation is still too high in Australia and a rate hike remains a very serious consideration. Right, let's have a look at how Indian markets are doing. Just opened for trade a few seconds ago, and we're seeing a little bit of softness uh, at the moment in the early going. I believe I saw the Sensex was off there by about, yeah, there we go, a quarter of 1% at the moment. Bank index pretty much flats as we await, of course, a decision from the Reserve Bank of India. So uh, coming up, that's what we're going to be talking about. India's central bank set to announce that rate decision in less than an hour. And we'll hear why Bloomberg Economics expects a cut have that conversation next. This is Bloomberg. India's central bank delivers its latest rate decision in the next hour. Bloomberg Economics is going against consensus, predicting a 25 basis point cut, ending a hawkish hold that we've seen since April last year. So for more on this, let's bring in senior India economist Abhishek Gupta in Mumbai. So uh, Abhishek, the uh, recent sell-off in the stock markets, the unwinding of the yen carry trade, how do you see all of this impacting the RBI decision today? Uh, hi, Paul. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, so I think there's already a lot of evidence which was pointing in the direction for the need for rate cuts for the Indian economy. Uh, and on top of this, uh, the developments this week uh, in terms of the global stock market route and unwinding of the yen carry trade uh, is likely to suggest that the global headwinds uh, are on the rise and the RBI is likely to acknowledge these. And I think this is, uh, this is something that should tip the RBI uh, or amplify uh, the reason for the RBI to now start easing. Uh, as such, uh, we have changed our call uh, early this week uh, to uh, for, for a 25 basis points rate cut. Earlier, we were only expecting a change in stance to neutral, uh, but now we see the RBI uh, changing its stance to neutral as well as uh, delivering a 25 basis points rate cut. All right, well, we've been hearing from uh, Governor Das in recent interviews. He's been sounding pretty hawkish, uh, suggesting that it's too early for rate cuts. So uh, you're calling for both a change in stance uh, to neutral and a 25 basis point cut. So what's behind this call? Uh, sure. So uh, as I mentioned, the developments this week, uh, but besides this, there was already a lot of uh, developments which have happened since the time uh, Governor Das gave that interview uh, in, in, in mid-July. Uh, so if you look at the domestic growth, uh, the latest indicators suggest that growth is slowing. Uh, for instance, credit growth uh, has slumped by six percentage points uh, between end May uh, to July from 20 percent. Uh, now it's down to 14 percent. Uh, if you look at inflation, uh, the latest data for the month of July, uh, the consensus estimate points to inflation uh, dropping below uh, RBS 4% target. Uh, consensus estimate is about 3.7, 3.8% uh, right now. Uh, and uh, besides that, even the current inflation series is overestimating headline inflation. Uh, new uh, consumer households inflation survey that was done earlier uh, this year uh, showed that the weightage on the consumer basket has shifted uh, in favor of uh, non-food items and away from food items. And India's uh, inflation, uh, which remains elevated, is largely due to uh, high inflation uh, currently. So that, uh, once you account for that uh, new uh, consumer expenditure survey weights, which we've done um, in, in our research, it shows that inflation is being overestimated by as much as 70 basis points. Uh, in addition to this, uh, you also have other reasons why the central bank uh, should consider uh, switching its stance. For instance, liquidity is now in uh, surplus mode, and that no longer uh, supports RBI's earlier uh, arguments that it wants to see greater transmission to higher lending and, and uh, uh, deposit rates. Uh, surplus liquidity typically uh, aligns with uh, a drop in uh, market uh, rates. Um, if you look at what's happening uh, in the real effective exchange rate market, uh, India's RER has appreciated by 3% uh, over the course of last few months and 7% uh, over the course of last year. And uh, that uh, mm -hmm. it comes uh, in the backdrop of RBI intervening in the FX market. Uh, RBI is buying uh, uh, FX to kind of uh, reduce the pressure on, on uh, rupee appreciation. So I think that would not be needed if the RBI uh, starts delivering rate cuts. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so you're putting forward quite a lot of evidence uh, favouring a rate cut, but you're a lonely voice. Why, why are you all alone with this call? Um, sorry, could you say that again, please? Well, you put forward a lot of evidence for a rate cut, but you're a very lonely voice. Why are you pretty much the only person making this call? Uh, that, that's a valid point. Uh, I think what's happening over here are two things. One is RBI governor's uh, recent hawkish uh, sort of stand that it's not time for rate cuts. So I think a lot of economists are just going by what the RBI uh, will do. Uh, and our stand on that is that uh, since facts have changed, uh, since the time that the RBI governor gave an interview, uh, we believe that he's likely to change his view and uh, go along with uh, the other dissenting members on the rate setting committee. So two of the six members had already voted for a rate cut at the previous meeting, and we believe that uh, the increasing evidence which calls for the need for uh, monetary policy easing should uh, sort of drive uh, RBI governor also to vote, vote for a, a rate cut uh, at, at today's meeting. All right, Bloomberg Economic Senior India Economist Abhishek Gupta there in Mumbai. We have plenty more to come. This is Bloomberg. I just want to update you on the Japan 30-year bond auction. Saw pretty good demand uh, despite volatile yields. So uh, we had a bid cover ratio that rose to 3.47. That was up from uh, 2.97 in the sale last month. Uh, the gap between the average and lowest accepted prices, uh, the tail, uh, also increased uh, to 0.17, up from 0.07 previously. So uh, a pretty reasonable result uh, for the 30-year auction of government notes uh, in an environment of uh, rather volatile yields. And that's not the only thing that's volatile at the moment. Uh, we've had markets moving all over the place today and it looks like uh, we're setting up for a positive session in the US uh, later on. Uh, we've got S&P e-mini futures uh, better by about a tenth of one percent. We did see some selling in the US uh, session yesterday in US time. It's all the spot index also backing off just a little. Of course uh, trading in Europe is going to get underway shortly as well. Uh, this is how we're setting up for trade there. Stock futures in negative territory, although in this environment anything could happen. Here's what's moving in global markets. Japanese equities turning positive after what's been another interesting day. That is it from Bloomberg Markets Asia, though. We've got Horizons Middle East and Africa coming up next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>